What's the difference between ego and armor? In this world that's constantly trying to silence us, to tell us that our stories do not matter, that we need to sit down and we need to shut up, sometimes it can feel like our ego is getting in the way of us telling our story. But in reality, we have an armor that we've put on to protect ourselves in this world. In this episode of the School for Artists podcast, we're delving into the difference between ego and armor and helping you understand how both can be writer's block and how you can get through it so you can tell your story. Sarah is in my Write Your Friggin' Book Already program, and she's also one of my VIP clients. So we do coaching together. She has a VIP weekend at my house. It's amazing. I love working with her. She is working on a memoir, a memoir to help boost her business, her growth. So we're talking a lot about what's coming up in her life around telling her story, what's coming up in her life around the idea that she wants to monetize her story, and what's coming up in her life over how she wants her story to come across to the world. Now, Sarah is from a marginalized community, and she's an amazing, wonderful human, but she has these blocks that she doesn't see as blocks that we're working through. And one of those blocks is she keeps saying, oh, my ego's getting in the way. Oh, my ego's getting in the way. I'm being too egotistical. That feels like I'm too full of myself. I'm worried about looking too egotistical, like I'm too full of myself. Raise your hand if you have totally felt like you want, are looking like you're too full of yourself when you're writing. Me, right here. For those who are listening, I have my hand raised. For those who are watching, you can see both of my hands raised in the air because I, for so long, worried that I had to feel humble in this world. I had to look humble in this world to have people want to read my writing. I think that's part of being raised as a marginalized person. It's very much a part of being socialized as a girl growing up. Don't be too full of yourself. Put yourself down. Don't think so too highly of yourself. That girl's got a big ego. What a bitch she is. All of these things, they actually play a role in when we're trying to tell our story. All of those things that I was told I shouldn't be. Don't be too fat. Don't be too loud. Don't be too gay. Don't be too feminine. Don't be f not feminine enough. Don't be too butch. Don't be too, don't be too, don't be too. All these things. And oftentimes they contradict themselves. And you don't know who you need to be. And what that ends up doing is it ends up making it so we don't know who we are and what our story is. So oftentimes in our group calls and write your friggin' book already, people come and they're like, I can't write my story. And I'm like, why? They're like, I don't have time. I don't have money. I don't have energy. I'm like, cool. Let's talk about time, money, and energy. And we delve deep into that. What comes up is this insecurity that their story's not good enough. They're worried it's going to be attacked if they put it on Twitter. They worry their friends and family are going to see themselves in their stories, even if it's novel and not and fiction, that they're going to think that it's them. They're worried that they're going to come out. I have a lot of clients who've come out through their writing working with me. Whether it's coming out as queer or coming out as a different part of yourself, they're worried they're going to open themselves up to attack. And oftentimes I see people say like, oh, that's just my ego getting in the way. That's just my ego getting in the way. I worry too about perfection. I'm a perfectionist or I'm egotistical. But I challenge you, if you're one of those people, to instead of asking yourself, is this my ego getting in the way? Asking yourself, what armor have I put on myself and my body so I feel protected in this world that doesn't feel safe for me? What part of your story doesn't feel safe? Now, I want you to think of a concept that I heard for the first time ever with through Brene Brown, but I know a lot of people talk about this. And that's the idea of a wound versus a scar. Now, I can talk about what it was like to grow up queer in a small town and how hard that was to feel like I was going to hell, like there was something wrong with me, like I was never going to find a lover because there was no one else out there like me. I was so, that was so engulfing and so hard for me as a kid. But now that I'm this like out proud queer person, it's a scar. It's a part of who I am, but it's not this tender thing now that I'm going through. 
The same thing happened with my brother's death for so long. It was a massive wound in my life when my brother died. It was a horrible wound. And if I got anywhere near it, I felt tender and horrible. So when I went out into the world and I wrote about it, and then people would respond to me, even the positive response hurt. It hurt so badly that I had to stop writing because I was writing about a wound. But now, almost a decade later, and lots of therapy, and lots of really like talking out loud to my brother and doing witchy stuff like that, I feel like I can talk about him and not have it hurt, not have it tear me apart. And that's the difference between scars and wounds, right? We can put our scars out there because they have that armor over them. But our wounds go out there and our ego starts acting up, being like, you can't, you can't, you can't, you're not ready. So part of understanding if you have armor on or if you have ego on is understanding, are you sharing a scar or are you sharing a wound? If you're sharing a wound, if you're sharing something that you're currently healing through, I'm not saying that's bad. In fact, sharing about my brother's grief was great for me because I found other people who were grieving and we were able to talk through this in a way that my friends who hadn't lost a loved one didn't know how to support me in. But what it also did is made it so I had to write a list of things that were off topic. I had to understand where I could share and where I couldn't. And that's not ego, right? Ego is when I share about when I was a sex blogger, y'all. My ego was all there all the time. I wanted to look so cool. I wanted to look like I was having amazing sex. I wanted to look like I was like totally able to like hook up with all these girls. And I was like totally Rico Suave. When in reality, I was a super awkward, super awkward person who go up to people and be like, you want to have, you want to have a date? Okay, no, bye. I'm just like run away. I was so awkward. And so what I wasn't doing is I wasn't being me. I wasn't telling my story. I was like putting these like Rico Suave. I was trying to be George Clooney. I was trying to be all these like suave men I'd seen in TV instead of just being my like little awkward dyke self that was like really had no idea how to talk to that cute girl in the corner. That's where ego comes into play. Ego is about trying to be someone you're not, telling a story that's not yours to tell. Even if you think it's a story that like ego is where you go and you write Twilight because you think that you people want you to write about sparkly vampires. But if you're not a sparkly vampire person, don't go out and write that. Ego happens when I have people who want to write romance and they're trying to write literary fiction because they think literary fiction will make them look cool. Or vice versa. They want to write a memoir, but they know romance sells, so they're trying to write romance. That's ego. Your armor. Your armor is, I'm writing about something that's not healed yet, and that's scary, and it's not right. So if you find yourself sitting there wondering if your work is good enough, wondering if it's safe to publish it, wondering if you can even write it, if you're even good enough, I want you to sit down and do this. I want you to make a list of all of your open wounds. And this can be really hard. And if it's triggering to you, please seek professional help because this can be really triggering for people. But if you sit down and you make a list of all the things you're not sharing with the public, all the things that don't have armor on it yet, all the things your ego is not ready to let out into the world, make that list. Make the list of the things that you're going to just journal about. You're going to save for you. You're not going to let other people into that part of your life just yet. Not until you're able to put your armor up. And then I want you to make a list of things that are safe. Scars. Topics you're happy to talk about. Things that are healed. Things that are still maybe a little like tender. You know, if you have a scar and you push it, it can be a little tender. I sliced my finger open like years ago. And if I press that spot, it's still a little tender. But it's not like going to break open and ruin my day if I touch against that. That's the difference between a scar and a wound. Make a list of all the things that are vulnerable, but are pre- you're prepared to share. And when you sit down to put something out in the world, ask yourself where it fits on that list. Is it something that you feel is still too tender or personal to put out in the world? Or is it something that you know is tender and vulnerable, but ready, has its armor? 
And then here's the last question, the hardest question, is when you go to share those things that feel ready to be shared, ask yourself what armor you can take off so you can be even more vulnerable, so you can be even more honest, so you can be even more truth-telling. What's the deeper truth underneath it? Are you still trying to protect yourself for some reason and why? And if that's a valid reason, listen, I don't share a lot about my family, when, especially when my brother was sick because he didn't want me to share about his stuff. That's a valid thing. Even if I was ready to share about it, he didn't want me to share about it, so I'm gonna put that armor up. Nope, there's a boundary. But sometimes I'm like, I don't wanna talk about being gay because I was told that talking about being gay was gonna lose me clients. Legitimately, I've been told that a lot. Don't talk so much about being gay. People aren't gonna to wanna to work with you. It sucks. And every time I talk, go to talk about being gay, I have to remind myself to remove the armor that heteronormative society has put on me and talk about it. So here's what you're gonna do. The next time you're sitting there trying to decide whether you have the right to share something, whether you can share something, whether you're vulnerable enough, whether it's good enough, da, 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 all those things that your ego and your self-protector and all that stuff comes up. You're gonna sit down and you're gonna ask yourself, is that a wound? If so, not sharing it. Is it about someone who doesn't want me to share? Also, not sharing it. Or is it something I wanna share? A truth that needs to be told. A deeper truth I can even go below that and tell. And how can I remove the armor I have around it and instead set up boundaries? Okay, folks, I hope that was as helpful for you as it was for my client. We had her in tears. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. And I hope that this gets you to go out and start thinking about the difference in your life between wounds and scars and armor and ego. And I hope this helps you tell deeper truths, get your story out in the world, and take off some of the silencing that happens to us as being a part of this world and community. I hope it helps you find your voice because the world needs your story now more than ever. Have a great, wonderful day, y'all, and I cannot wait to read your books. This week's School for Writers book recommendation is The Parasol Protectorate. It's actually five books by Gail Carriger, and I completely devoured the whole series. I loved them on audiobook. I found myself taking two-hour walks just so I could keep listening, completely obsessed. So here's the premise. You are in steampunky style Victorian, I think, or Elizabethan England, some kind of old England, which y'all know I'm not a big fan of historical fiction. So for me to be suggesting a historical fiction book is huge. So you're in that time and there are vampires and werewolves and witches like type things. Y'all know I love those vampires, werewolves, and witches stories. And they are working together and they're like in their own little parliament and they work together and they have their own things, um, but they like hate each other still, but they're working together and they're like out. The world knows about them and they're fighting. And there's this one woman who's the main character and she, if she touches people, it can make all their supernatural powers go away. And she falls in love with the werewolf and how that all happens and what that all happens. And it's like this whole combination of stories and there's ancient Egyptians brought in and there's people from all over and it's funny and it's quirky and it's got some cool steampunk elements of like fun examples of what kind of technology could have happened. And I don't know, it just it just took me into this fun, exciting world of the past that was you know, a queer positive and body positive and sex positive and really, really kind of prim and proper in this fun way that they like make fun of themselves for. I loved it. I do have to say that because it's set in the past, there are some elements like, for example, people are like bringing artifacts back from Egypt. Not cool. Not cool at all, folks. Like totally imperialistic bullshit. And they don't really address that as a modern person, but you're set in the past. So they they address it in some way, but it's not really like as much as I would like to. You know, some kind of something in the front of the book would be nice saying, hey, we don't approve of this. I understand it's historical and that's a really hard line to draw, but I kind of was a little, there was in a whole episode where they like are take whole part of the series where they're taking stuff back from Egypt. And that felt a little icky to me, a lot of icky to me, even though it's historical and historically accurate, I wanted there to be some reflection on how wrong that was. So that was a problem that I had with the series. 
I want to be honest about that. But other than that, I friggin' loved it. I loved it. I devoured it. I found myself listening. I loved the person who narrated it, highly suggested an audiobook, and I found myself going on extra long walks just so I could listen. So once again, it's The Parasol Protectorate by Gail Carriger. It's a five-part series, and I would say if you like steampunk at all, if you like uh, werewolf, vampire type stuff at all, if you like fantasy at all, if you like historical fiction at all, if you like... It's a romance, but kind of more like fantasy than romance. It has a romance aspect to it. I just loved it. And I would say just go ahead and get yourself at least the first book on audiobook and then listen to them all. If you're going to grab it on audiobook, I highly suggest using our link to Libro.fm. Libro.fm is a great alternative to that big, giant Amazon-owned company that we know about that sells audiobooks. And it lets you keep your the rights to your books. So you can share them with friends. And when you buy it through a audiobook through Libro.fm, you choose a local independent bookstore to have your purchases go towards. So you're supporting local independent bookstores while buying audiobooks. I love it. We have a link in our show notes and in our bios on all of our social media to have you get a free audiobook and we get a free audiobook. So go use that link if you're going to sign up for Libro.fm. We get an audiobook to review and you all get a free audiobook as well. And if you decide to get a physical copy, also we have a bookshop.org link. That's an affiliate link that supports the School for Writers podcast. And just like Libro.fm, bookshop.org allows you to support a local independent bookstore when you buy your book. So go support your local independent bookstores. It makes a huge difference in diversity out there. And grab yourself the whole series of The Parasol Protectorate by Gail Carriger. (laughs) 